Open your Bibles to Psalm 139. We're going to be working with a couple of key verses. In my, my prayer notebook, I have a, a variety of things that I visit and revisit. Some of those things, because for me, January and this time of year, two times a year, when I like to just touch base with some things and see, how am I doing? You know, I'm going to talk to God, hey, are we, we all good today? Uh, but to really truly measure, how am I doing? Where am I growing? Where do I need to grow? Where do my next steps need to be? And so to do a little spiritual evaluation. And what I want to share with you today uh, is something I haven't used in several years. I have different tools I've, I've used at these seasons. This one uh, is particularly meaningful to me, and I have been spending time with it over the last week, uh, really digging in with some questions and answering those questions, not just asking them, but answering some big questions about my life and relationship to my Lord, uh, following Jesus, what, what does it look like, what should it look like in the days ahead, and so uh, it's been say, about 10 years since I have worked through this set of questions, and it's been really useful to me, and I hope it will be useful to you as well. It comes from a guy named Fred Smith, and Fred uh, was a close personal friend of Billy Graham, and really instrumental in all kinds of ways in forming what came to be known as Christianity Today as a ministry, the publications that they produce. They have the thing called Leadership Journal that uh, I began reading when I was a high school student. Uh, and then continued on through college. And uh, Fred Smith was a, quarter, is a quarterly uh, journal, and uh, he was a contributor every quarter. He's a business guy. He's not a pastor. He's not a theologian. He's a businessman who really loved the Lord and didn't waste anything in, that, uh, in the opportunities that God presented him to shine for Christ. And so this thing of a spiritual audit is Fred Smith's idea, and here's how he came uh, to experience it. He said he was teaching an adult Sunday school class, and in the class, one of his class members said, hey, Fred, could we get together for lunch? Well, they got together for lunch. The guy said, here's, here's my issue. And this is a CEO of a major firm. He said, I have a CPA to keep me liquid, a lawyer to keep me legal, and a doctor to keep me healthy, but I have no one to help assess my spiritual condition and the guy asked him can you give me a spiritual audit and that's where all of this is coming from and Fred started working on that thinking about it and it inspired him and he started asking some key questions in his own life and he shared it in a leadership journal article and I had the opportunity oh my goodness 20 21 years ago or so now to have breakfast with Fred Smith and I talked to him about this article uh, and how it had shaped my life early on and continued to, to touch my life. And so I just want to share these questions with you. Now, most people, I recognize when you hear, hey, we're going to audit you today. You go, well, I'd like to run with the children right out the back door. Uh, I, audit's not a positive thing the way most people think about it. This, uh, this last week, we had a whole team of folks over here in our administration building auditors doing our church's annual financial audit our stewardship committee uh, then when the results come in they'll review it we make sure what's good, what we're doing and all this so anyway people say when I say hey we have an annual financial audit people say do you have a problem I said no and we'd like to keep it that way and that's why we have a regular financial audit to be accountable in, in the things that we do now here's here's why we do it you, you make sure uh, everything we do and how we do it is sound financially and audit checks to see am I doing what I say I'm doing are we doing as a church what we say we're doing financially checks to see if we're acting consistently with what we declare through our plans through our procedures and it evaluates a little bit of how you're doing what you do so our audit related to financial things but the same thing relates to a spiritual audit the whole idea, you say, I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. Okay, well, let's measure that. Let's see, if, let's see if I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus. Here is my actual life day to day. And do those two things, do they, do they line up? Or, or is it really skewed? Are there some things that need to be shifted, adjusted, so that what you profess and what you live align? That's what we want to work on today. How are you doing 
what you do in relationship to Jesus Christ. Are you doing what you say you're supposed to be doing? And this is a good time to uh, evaluate and discover. Here we go. Our passage from Psalm 30, 139, and it's a prayer, and it's a great prayer, prayer of David. And it says, search me, God, and know my heart. Oh, inviting God into the, into the conversation. Search me, O oh God, know my heart. You've got to make that your prayer today because you'll just let this roll, uh, water off a duck's back kind of thing. You'll ignore this whole thing unless you invite God into the discussion. Search me, O oh God, know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. Uh, some translation, my anxious heart. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Now, that prayer will take you a long way. That's not a bad prayer to pray every morning, maybe through the fall, as you, as you gear into where is God working in me and where, does he, I, where do I need Him to be working in me? Most of us are, regular, are uh, accustomed to regular evaluations in different places where we function. Uh, you, you may have a monthly evaluation with your supervisor at work or a, certainly an annual uh, review of how, how you're doing, what are you, how's your, how are you progressing, what are your goals. With the school year being, beginning, we recognize that in school is regular testing. and The tests that you have just to see students and to measure it for the teachers too. Are the students learning what they need to learn? Are they accomplishing the goals, the objectives that are set before us and giving them the quality education that has been entrusted to us to pass along to them so we're used to it in a lot of different areas of life. We evaluate everything in our world. We evaluate the TV programs we watch, the movies that come out. We love now with social media and all those things, we share our opinions about just everything, and we have opinions about everything. Uh, people go off on their, you, you stay at a hotel, they invite you to evaluate the hotel, and, but you really don't need much invitation because most people just hear the 20 things I don't like about my hotel room. Here's, here's, here's the 10 things that are terrible about the tacos at that particular restaurant. And we love to evaluate everything in our world. We're constantly giving feedback, whether it's formal or informal or just telling our friends, I would never shop there again at that store. We're always evaluating until we get to our spiritual life. And that's the weird part. Our, our relationship to Almighty God. And that one, we just think that somehow it's just going to evolve in the right direction. In our sinful nature, even as a follower of Jesus Christ, we are always going to drift away from God. We're not going to drift toward God ever, ever, ever. And so, why is it that we don't like to pull out the yardstick and see how much we have grown with Christ in the last year? In this particular area of our life, we're just slow to set goals, slow to reflect, slow to evaluate, to deliberate about improvements. So it's important we just understand this. God wants to be intentional about your spiritual growth. We're, we're intentional about almost everything except relationship to God. And then it's just haphazard, slappy, happy, throwing something against the wall and hoping that something works out somewhere in our spiritual life. And that should not be so when we're talking about Almighty God. This process of growth is what we call discipleship. And discipleship is simple, simple definition for discipleship. I want to become more like Jesus. And what was important to Jesus, what Jesus modeled, what Jesus taught, that's what I want. And I want to take a next step. I want to keep moving forward to become more like him every day in who I am and what's important to me and what is not important to me. Here's some things the Bible says about this. <laughs> our Lord, here's how, here's how intent he is. The Lord's lamp sheds light on a person's life, searching the innermost parts you are under the magnifying glass of a holy God. I, the Lord, examine the mind and test the heart to give each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. He is evaluating and he is rewarding and disciplining according to what he finds. He is testing hearts. All the, a lot of the experiences you have, I don't know why this happened to me. To see what you will do with it, says God. To see how you will respond. To see if I can break you out of the rut that you're in. To take a next step. To, be a, to grow in your faith. To grow in your faithfulness. We're also called out just by the biblical writers. 
our hearts, our lives before the Lord. Let us examine and probe our ways and turn back to the Lord. Uh, Lamentations. And that was a book. Uh, the book of Lamentations comes after the book of Jeremiah, written by Jeremiah. And it's a book about how God's people fell so far away from God. Dr- and not just in a drift, but in deliberate choices that they made. Turn back to the Lord. Test to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? Don't, don't miss the, the import of that particular, that particular passage unless you fail the test. One of the things you're going to have to test out is, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I was baptized. I walked down an aisle. I raised my hand during a youth camp. Uh, I'm a Christian. He says, don't think that any of those things will save you. I said a sinner's prayer. Don't think any of those things are what are going to save you. You know what saves you? Jesus, Jesus saves you. And if you're saved, there are certain things that happen because you're saved. Again, I'm a Christian. I belong to Jesus. Here's my life. And those things do not line up. Then unless you fail the test. And we may need to start at a more basic level than we have considered in this examination. This morning, I'm going to take you through some evaluation questions. You see there are a good number of them. And I have 15 minutes or so, so how, how hard could it be, right? Yeah, I encourage you. I'm going to move through these rapidly, but here's what I want to encourage you to do. You've got to keep this list with you and maybe put a star beside the one to say, this is the one I really need to dig in on. I, I need to write some things. I need to journal some things. I need to pray about this uh, on a daily basis for a while to unpack this of where God's leading me in my life. We're, we're not going to be able to do all of that in an, an hour on a Sunday morning, but there's opportunity to lean in to what God wants to do in your life in these next several months. Here's the first thing. These from Fred Smith. Am I content with who I am becoming? You know, every day you're just moving closer to what you're ultimately going to be, and it's not going to get beyond there. I, am I making the necessary choices and satisfied with the process that is in place on the journey? You know, I fear... I fear that so many people, if, if your TV reception with whatever provider you have got a little fuzzy for a few days, you would throw a fit. But we are content to stumble along in a spiritual fog for years and don't give a rip about it. We just, we just keep on bumping into things in the darkness that we have created for ourselves spiritually. Listen, when it comes to this, our temptation is to compare ourselves to other people. So look up and down your row right now. Just go ahead, take a minute. Look at the people seated on your row. Well, there's some real losers on your row, right? I mean, you, and, and, and by the way, if you don't see them, well, it's you. But um, no, that's how we do it. We look around and go, oh, I got to be more spiritual than that guy. I have to be closer to Jesus than that guy is. And we do that kind of evaluation all the time. And that's not the standard. The standard is Jesus Christ. The goal is Christ-likeness. And so the standard we measure ourselves against is Jesus himself. And that puts us on a different path when it comes to discipleship. One of the things that needs to happen is we need to spend more time with Jesus. More time with Jesus in prayer. More time maybe just reading through the Gospels to say, well, what was important to Jesus? And writing down, well, Jesus really cared about this. Some of you have done the, the sword method of you, know, you ask questions about Bible stories or Bible verses and one of the things is, what is this? You read a passage and you say, what does this say about Jesus? What does this say about God? I probably ought to lean into whatever that is. Because if I start seeing what he's, what's important to him and what he does, that is going to direct my path in who I am becoming. The Bible says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. This is from the message. So I, I'm pulling some things from the message because they're just a new way of hearing it for you. Keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. Second thing, am I becoming less religious and more spiritual? Now, people in surveys say, Are you, how would you describe yourself with God? And a lot of people will, will lean toward the um, spiritual, not religious. And that's probably not a bad answer in many ways, although it may not change how you actually live in life. We, our default setting is toward religion, which means checking boxes, went to church, 
uh, read my Bible, uh, listened to a sermon, a podcast or a radio station this week. Um, I gave some money to uh, this guy that was at a street corner, was homeless, uh, so did something good for somebody there. I, I, you just checking boxes. Religion. You look at the Pharisees in the Bible, they weren't slackers. They were super intense about their religion. They were doing stuff all the time and checking boxes. Check, 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 check. Good. Kind of like, there's a reason for it, but the old offering envelopes we used to have, and some of you remember these. You went to Sunday school and you, you filled out your offering envelope every Sunday and it had a checklist. And it said, read, read my Bible daily, invited someone to church, attending worship, attending Sunday school. And there was a whole, giving today, there's a whole set of things. And if you got them all, you were 100% Christian. Well, you know, that just didn't, that's not, not necessarily so, right? That may not measure anything at all. Are you growing in your relationship to God? It's not, I could do all, I could do all those things on that box and be, be far, far from a relationship to God. Do you have a relationship? Have you moved all this religious stuff from your head to your heart? You know, we, we say sometimes the average distance between a man's head and heart is about 18 inches. A lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. They got it all here. They never got it to there. And somewhere in here, are you growing more in a relationship to God? Spiritually mature. Am I becoming what God wants me to be? Am I walking with Him? Because... Religion, here's the thing about it, I can control every bit of it. It can all be just my willpower and my list. Because everybody's got their own list of, no, I'm a good person because here's my list and I made it up myself. That's what the Pharisees did. The spiritual life, the relationship thing is Jesus is the king. He's in charge, not me. He's directing my paths. He is guiding me. He's the boss, not me. And that's a different journey. This uh, came from Isaiah and uh, came across this. Uh, as I'm, right now, I'm, I'm reading through uh, Isaiah. And uh, so I got this uh, oh, a couple days ago in my reading from chapter 1. And this is from the message, paraphrase. I looked at it. I'm reading a different translation uh, in my Bible reading. But uh, the message, again, he's talking about religious people that are disconnected from genuine faith. And he says this, quit your worship charades which is a lot of fun way to say that. I can't stand your trivial religious games, monthly conferences, weekly Sabbaths, special meetings, 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 meetings. I can't stand one more. That's not too far off, actually, from what the translation says. You're doing stuff all the time. You're getting together. You're doing all your sacred assemblies and your special things and your offerings and your sacrifices, and it's a bunch of foolishness because you don't know me, God says. The temptation has become so busy with the doing for the Lord that we just... Then you're kind of like Dana Carvey being the church lady. You just do, you just playing a role. In your audit, ask how much of my life is religious fluff and how much is genuine spiritual growth? God taking hold of my life as King and Lord and Master. What, and how would you prove it? What bears the mark of God's hand on your life? Where would you say it is evident to anybody anywhere? Third thing, does my family recognize the authenticity of my faith? Does my family recognize the authenticity of my faith? People living at your house, your extended family. Uh, think about Noah. So God says to Noah, Noah, we're going to destroy the world. It's so sinful, so broken, but I see some things in you. And uh, I want you and your family to build this big old boat in the desert. Now, there is no indication in Genesis that, that God ever spoke to Moses. Hey, let, Moses, let's gather everybody up in the living room. Get Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Noah and uh, all the little, little Noahs. Let's get them all in a big circle. And the, uh, the little Noah, the, the, the boys, uh, three boys, get their wives in here. Hey, I'm the Lord God. And I've told Noah this, but I'm telling you now, uh, I want you all to build a boat. There's no indication he ever talked to anybody but Noah. Noah takes off doing this, and they didn't have him committed. That's the miracle. His family did, just didn't have him locked up for doing crazy things. That didn't make any sense. Why would they follow him so closely? And I, I think the reason is, Genesis 6, 9. These are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God. And you know who knew that best? His family. 
unquestioned. In, among his contemporaries, in his generation, when nobody else was doing it, he was doing it. And here's your question. Does, does my family see my spiritual growth? Not, I'm a nice guy. Not, uh, I've done things at church before. But do they see me as a growing person with Christ? Do they see me as faithful? Do they see me as taking next steps? Do they see me as someone who is seeking to serve the Lord God? Am I consistent? That's part of it. Because sometimes you can do all the right stuff when you're on this campus, but at home or at work, it's just a whole different story. And everybody knows that too. Especially those who know you best. Are you consistent in all the environments where you function? Do the people who know you best, and I'm talking about your family, do they respect you and do they recognize the spiritual growth in you the most? Because they're close and they see it up close. Fourth thing, do I have a flow-through philosophy? And I like this verse for this. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, I will have streams of living water flow from deep within. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Streams of living water. That's not the only time that that shows up, Old or New Testament. We are called to be conduits of grace, not dead ends, not stagnant ponds of blessing but conduits of grace, living water. There's a flow through here, and this is where we really stall out, especially in our, our version of Christianity, this American version of it, really different than a lot of parts of the world and historically different than the flow of a lot of Christian faith across uh, centuries, is that uh, we have so much available. And we do have... I mean, you can listen to, to a couple of sermons. Some of you on your commute, you can knock off two sermons on a podcast or on a commute or at lunch. And I've had this conversation with so many people over time, here, there, and everywhere. Okay, I got a Bible study. Uh, I go to Sunday. I'm in church and Sunday school. And then I got a Bible study on Monday night and have a women's group on Tuesday night. And then Wednesday night, I'm doing this Bible study. And then I'm listening to this podcast. And then I'm hearing this guy. So I've got about 10 inputs into my life of, you know what? You don't have time to obey God in even one thing because you're too busy becoming a dead sea. The water's flowing into you, but nothing's coming out. You don't have time to obey God. You don't have time to, to serve. You don't have time to grow. You're a dead end. And that's a tragedy of our generation. We have so much available to us. We have, we've taken it that all the blessings that we have are for us. And that's just not so biblically. He has designed us to be conduits of His grace. There's an inhale from the Word, from community, uh, from prayer, from serve. And then we go serve, and we share the gospel, and we, there's, an out, there's an input, and there's an output. And that is the nature of spiritual growth. And where is the output in your life? Fifth thing, by the way, it's a balance, too. Because if everything is output and there's no input, uh, you're going to dry up spiritually. And that's when people burn out because uh, they were so busy doing, they stopped, uh, they stopped refreshing in Christ. Do I have a quiet center to my life is the fifth thing. The story of Mary and Martha comes to mind for me. And man, in this part of the world, good old North Texas, there's no shortage of Marthas. In Luke 10, we find the story of these two sisters and... Uh, you know, Jesus has come over to the house, and they're, they're close. They're great supporters of his, encouragers for Jesus. You got Mary and you got Martha. And Jesus is, he's sharing, he's sharing God's word. He's a teacher, and he is sharing and encouraging. And Mary, she just sits there and soaks it all in. And Martha, she's the, she's the doer. She's, her life is, and I feel this, man, because this is, this is a lot of my wiring. She's filled up with to-do lists and resume accomplishments, and she is checking boxes and taking care of business. Martha is, she, she can move a lot of things forward. And she gets mad because Mary's sitting there just listening to Jesus, and we got to serve a meal. We have to get the house taken care of. We have all these responsibilities. And she finally goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. Good old sibling rivalry thing, even as adults. Help my, tell my sister to do, she needs to help me. 
Jesus, uh, he says, Martha, Martha. You never want Jesus to call your name twice. Kind of like mom and dad. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. There's a difference between ministry and busyness, the fast track and the frantic life. And at the heart of your life, is there a place where you still your heart and you listen to what? Not, oh, I had my prayer time this morning. Uh, I, I had a list of 50 things and I just read them all off to Jesus and they were all squared away for today. Did you take any time to listen to what Jesus might have to say to you? Did you open your Bible and spend some time? What do you have to say to me? And as you say it, I want to write it down. Because I don't want to miss anything God has to say to me. My Savior has to say to me from His Word. Is there a place where you have a quiet center to your life where you are still before God long enough that you can hear what He says and know what He's saying and what He wants you to do next? Have I defined my unique ministry? This is important uh, for a spiritual audit. We are His workmanship, Paul wrote. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Have you found your place where this is your sweet spot of serving? And at this stage in my life, and for a lot of you who've been a believer for a long time, the longer you're a believer, the more the spiritual gifts that you will display, because Jesus displayed all of them. And if you become more like Jesus, you'll see more of those things. So spiritual gift inventories are helpful, but your experiences are going to be a big part of where ministry leads you. Sometimes your most hurtful experiences, the places where God busts the door open widest for ministry opportunity to others, is, uh, is there something you're just passionate about? Is there something you're good at at work that you could transfer into Christian ministry circles? You've got to find a, a place to serve. It's one of those output things, to serve the, in the, within the body of Christ. And have you found that place? Uh, I've had this conversation plenty of times. I just come to church to be fed. Well, that's a, probably an overly obese uh, spiritual life that is not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. There has to be the input and there has to be the outflow again. Do you have a ministry where you are using the gifts God has given you? Because honestly, after you've been a Christian for even a couple of years, and you're leaning into it at any level, another Bible study is probably not going to help you grow nearly so much, and it's mostly because you don't need a hundred of them. Another Bible study is not going to help you grow nearly as much as service because that's when you start, you're, 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 the rubber hits the road. You are now in the game. You're not sitting on the sidelines. And so now you, you pray differently and you read your Bible differently. A lot of people have said uh, what we're doing in our community outreach has done that for them. They said, you know, it scares me to death, but without faith it's impossible to please God. And I start, I start doing faith stuff and change how... God speaks to me from the word, changed how I pray, changed what's important to me. A lot of my priorities shifted when I started just doing what? In ministry, serving the Lord. Find a place to serve, your unique ministry. And if you need help getting off sidelines into the game, we would love to encourage you in those next steps. Is my prayer life improving? And uh, you know, how do you know, right? How do you measure? You say, well, uh, well, I used to pray for two minutes a day, and now I'm praying for five minutes a day, so... Is it in volume? Is that how you measure whether your prayer life's improving? Well, it's not a terrible measure, but it's not the beginning and end of the measure. What about, uh, you know, I just schedule. It's it's every morning. Before I do anything else, I have my time with the Lord. Well, that's good. Is it in volume, scheduling? I think here's the real test. Do my decisions have prayer as an integral part, or do I make decisions from my desires and then pray? Is your prayer life mostly asking God to clean up the mess you've made by the decisions you made without Him? That we say, well, here's what I want. Here's the way I think my life should work. And God, please bless this mess. Well, God's just not under a lot of obligation to bless the mess that we make. He wants to be a part of the front end to keep us out of those messes and to empower us. And, but now here's the... That's not the beginning into that one. I'm going to circle back to that uh, in a moment. Instead of making a list of requests that God bless your agenda, what if you said, God, let me get on your agenda. Jesus described the right orientation. Just how you set your heart and mind in, uh, in prayer. 
improving your prayer life, growing your prayer life. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those other things, the things that usually make our, the top of our prayer list, all those other things start falling into place. And we start living the life that he's called us to live. Number eight, have I maintained a genuine awe of God? Now, this is a, this is a unique one. Uh, and it's something I've been praying for myself for a while. Uh, this is an amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Jesus died on the cross for me. Okay, so when we were saying that a while ago, did, did you take pause with those words? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. was blind, but now I see. Does that, does that make your knees buckle underneath you to consider what God has done? At the cross for you? I recognize that some of you said, I like the first song, I didn't like the second one. I like the second one, I didn't like the first one. If that was your evaluation, the repentance is the next thing you need to do for sin in your life. See, we, we get stuck on so many other things. And meanwhile, Almighty God is at work around us and He invites us to join Him in His work, and we're just letting Him pass by. Do you have a genuine awe of God? When I observe the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. Uh, do you just choke down when you consider what God's word says sometimes? When you're singing one of these songs that incorporates the the song of heaven. Now, that first song we sang, several things out of the book of Revelation. Those were songs of heaven, not songs of your favorite song book. Now, did you, did you kind of, did you feel it? Were you open to feeling that? I've asked God to, to overwhelm me more often, and I found myself being overwhelmed. How about this? When you open your Bible, do you do so with fear and trembling? Open my Bible this morning knowing that I'm picking up in Isaiah chapter 7. And I know it's in Isaiah chapter 7. And I open it up, and I think, Almighty God's about to start talking to me. And I need to be positioned well to hear what he has to say. Worship is seeking to know God better and love God more. Do you have a growing sense of the nearness of God in your life? Number nine. Is my humility genuine? Well, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way, says the great song. Here's what the Bible says. In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. We're called to humble ourselves. This is a uniquely Christian attribute. Uh, the rest of the world thinks humility is weakness. Only in, Christian, uh, in Christianity is humility elevated to the highest levels. And, and part of this is just saying, I have enough humility to know I don't know everything. And also to know that I can't do a lot of things. To recognize God is my Lord. He is my King. He is over all. And I'm a whole lot less than any of that. And it positions me well for growth. And it positions me well to become more like Christ. Are you growing in humility? Realizing more and more that life, I'm talking, even your own life is not about you and what you want and your preferences. It's about God and his agenda. His agenda for our life and his agenda for our world. It's not about your viewpoints, about a thousand different things. It's about what God says. And what God says is important. And are you willing to follow him even when it's hard. Is my spiritual feeding and diet right for me? We're concerned about a balanced diet for our bodies. We need a balanced diet for our souls. Jeremiah said, your words were found and I ate them. He, he's consuming the word of God. Your words became a delight to me and a joy to my heart. Are you consistent in your time, balanced in your diet of God's word? Are you are you experiencing the whole counsel of God's word? One of the reasons why we wanted to do walk through the Bible is because we really feel like 
the Old Testament, which is powerful, life-changing, uh, insightful to how we live today, the challenges we face today, it's really a, it's a closed book. Because we, we, so we want to open up the whole counsel of God. So many people, so what are you reading about the Bible today? What, you, what does God's Word have to say to you? Well, I have these 25 favorite verses that are my cheerleader verses, and I, I look at those. Yeah, but we don't read the things about our sin, about our need to move from where we've been, about how getting unstuck from spiritual ruts that are counterproductive to the kingdom of God purpose. Uh, the whole counsel of God. Or do you have a balanced diet? In God's word. You can hear all of what he has to say to you. Are you neglecting, avoiding the hard parts, the difficult parts? Number 11 is obedience in small matters built into my reflexes. At this point, this is not about good intentions. Our good intentions don't amount to a hill of beans. What are you doing that you shouldn't be doing? What should you be doing that you are not doing? Are you rapid in your repentance? rapidly turning away from sin are you rapid in your obedience not taking God's word under advisement taking God's ways under uh, consideration but when God says do you say then I am turning things around and I'm going to do what God told me to do in the big things in the small things do you rationalize or do you repent do you confess or do you make excuses in any area of your life that's not under God's control Think about it. Is uh, In the physical dimensions of your life, the money management, uh, the time management, your sex life, your thought life, in all areas, is there anything that's, that's operating, consistently operating outside of God's will and God's ways? And you know it. And you know, honestly, we usually know it. We're just comfortable with it. Are we uh, obedient in even the small things? And is that the go-to in our lives? Jesus said... His master will say to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You're faithful over a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Be faithful in the basic small things. It's not just, is God calling me to move to a new city? Is God calling me to a new career? Is God, is God just calling me to love my next door neighbor who's hard to love right now? Is God calling me to spend time in prayer with him every day? Be obedient in small things and all the other things built. Number 12. Well, not too far off. Do I have joy? How about that question? Do I have joy? Do you know what? If you belong to Jesus Christ and you're following him, joy is one of the things, it's, it's just going to happen. And if your life is not characterized by joy, and I'm not talking just about, <laughs> I'm talking about, is it real in you? I mean, is it that sustaining thing that no matter what circumstances bring to you, it does not, it does not rock your joy? Or are you just sour and angry? Some of the meanest people I've ever known were Christians or professing Christians. That shouldn't be so, right? Joy should characterize our lives. A relationship to God through Jesus Christ will produce joy. A deep sense of fulfillment and satisfaction because of God at work in that life. And here's what happens. Doubt and disobedience will diminish your joy in Christ. Faith increases joy in Christ, no matter what the circumstances. Obedience increases joy in in Christ and how about this does my joy even extend into my suffering because see just it's a reminder I've said this multiple times in the last year this world that you're living in right now if you wanted this to be heaven you're going to be really disappointed this is not heaven heaven's still out there this is not the perfect place this is the broken world we're living in we can live in it as followers of Jesus Christ restored renewed and growing becoming Don't let difficult things steal your joy. In fact, let difficult things inspire your relationship to Christ to take a next level step. Consider it great joy, James writes. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Is joy growing in your life? And if not, why not? Why not? And not I'm not just... Not just sometimes, but is joy a growing factor in your life? More evident to the people who know you best, love you most even. Is joy growing in your life? And if not, why not? I want to share this passage again, this time from the message. Psalm 139. This paraphrase. This is a good prayer for a spiritual audit. Investigate my life, O God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. 
See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong. Then guide me on the road to eternal life. You pray that prayer every day for the next few months. You know, God's going to do something special in your life, I believe. Let's, let's evaluate well. But not just for the sake of being beaten down. Well, I'm terrible at that. I'm terrible at that. I'm not doing any well. But turn something loose to say, I'm going to move beyond where I've been. And I'm going to experience God in a whole new way in this season. Regardless of my age, my stage of life, what's going on in me, what's going on around me. To God be the glory.